Okay. Just letting a few people in. So my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is the second of our kind of after hours uh, public comment meetings. So today um, is a meeting of the board dedicated exclusively towards public comment. Um, you know, we can just really get started, just letting folks in, admitting them right now. If, you, um, if you'd like to come join us in person, I'm over at our Cannabis Board office at 89 Main Street in Montpelier um, is our uh, physical location. Um, otherwise, it looks like most people have joined by the link. So if you would like to make a public comment and you've joined by the link, please feel free to raise your virtual hand. And uh, France, Francis, you've got the honor of going first. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner Pepper. Uh, uh, hello to uh, the rest of the commission. Uh, thank you for having this session for all your hard work the last number of months, I know it hasn't been easy. I have a few basic comments tonight. Uh, the first thing I'd like to tell you is we did vote uh, for retail in Jamaica, Vermont, and we did vote against integrated, but that is not because we don't want to have integrated in the future. Uh, that was a consensus amongst the residents and voters about the limited licensing. So that just to make that clear, that's the, the definition of that vote. Um, but I'd like to shift for a moment to the medical program. And I've made these comments to you before, but I'm going to reinforce them one more time in the hopes that we can advance this program. Uh, and first of all, I see no reason why there's a fee for cards, especially for low income individuals. Um, I had been through this myself two years in a row where my doctor signed my paperwork, but technically I was not a medical patient. Uh, which I demonstrated to my legislators, and, and it was fine. But uh, if we could do that, that would be great. Uh, the, I, know, I read the article that Seven Days put out and that you uh, pushed to us on Twitter, and it was informative. And I noted that the dispensary is going to be able to basically grow what they need to, whether it's for retail or for medical. Um, I have been an advocate, of course, and I believe I said this before, for an increase in plant count. But if they're going to be able to grow what they need to, I think we need to really look at loosening all the restrictions around any medical patient, especially those who need uh, to make oils and that kind of thing, which requires uh, a good amount of plant material and also requires uh, multiple cultivars. So no disparity on that. Let's uh, keep it equal. If they get to do it, if the goose gets to do it, the gander does too. Um, I don't think we'll have a problem uh, with any issues on that. I think that uh, will work out fine for people. It'll help a lot of people out, especially those who can't afford to go to a dispensary. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually the uh, gentleman who carried a first plan into Vermont Patients Alliance in Montpelier. So I'm not anti-dispensary, but I am uh, uh, forward on the idea of expanding the role of the caregivers in Vermont. Um, I, I, I was able to get one patient for one caregiver and for another patient a long time ago. I think it's time we expand that. Uh, it's a very important thing and give those caregivers the increased uh, plant count uh, that anyone in the dispensary or as a, you know, or as a patient would have either way. Uh, going on from there, uh, I'd like to see that program expanded in the way that the main program had been up to about two, 2020 is what I'm re recollecting. Um, it was a good model. It's worked out well for them. They have several thousand caregivers that help many, many people. Uh, and uh, it's, I, I know some of them personally over there. I've worked with uh, labs that produce a clean, effective, and affordable cancer oil, uh, for, you know, also for Parkinson and other severe disease. So that is something that I think we seriously need to look at so that we can provide the uh, life-saving, sometimes life-saving and certainly uh, improving quality oils that have not been present in this program since its inception, due to whatever reason, cost or whatever it was at that time. So uh, that's that's that. And then one more thing, I've spoken to uh, Senate, Senator Ballas and uh, Representative Paella, 
and I believe we had spoken to uh, uh, Senator Benning about possibly getting the votes for farm to table. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the medical program would be enhanced by that. Let's say a farmer became a caregiver. And then the farmers that are now pr producing our food safely uh, could produce cannabis and increase their income with even an acre uh, of cannabis or even a smaller grow, uh, depending on what they were doing. And that would lift all of the small business people in the state, all the people that really need it, and it would provide jobs that are better than a $15 an hour trimming job somewhere in Burlington. And so that would be my comments for today. If anybody had any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you've already covered any of these issues, I do apologize. I haven't been able to attend every meeting in the cycle. I've been doing all the medical uh, meetings, and I think we've made some progress there. So thank you very much for taking my comments. Thanks, Fran. Um, next on my list is Paul Shannon. Paul, feel free to unmute yourself and join us by video if you'd like. Good evening. Um, my comments are, uh, they're many fold. I've done some research and it has uh, a lot of questions come to mind. I know this isn't the forum for questions. I didn't come with that. But what I'd like to know is, do I send it, the questions to 89 Main Street, uh, to you folks there, and hope to get some answers in return? I mean, we're not, uh, my daughter and I have raised the funds between us um, for the oil and license, uh, saying as her dad was popped a couple of times for cannabis and paid a pretty stiff price. Um, but the point being is, uh, we're looking to make a sincere investment in this. And um, I mean, like, we're not interested in a storefront, but more like a destination. And there are questions regarding, um, I just heard that gentleman say that uh, he answered one of them uh, as to how much the dispensaries are going to be allowed to grow. And if it's enough so that we would have sufficient inventory, that's great. But I mean, questions regarding clumps. Do I go to the dispensaries, uh, do they have to be licensed? Can I go out of state? I mean, there are a hundred questions that I need to answer in order to draw up a proper and appropriate uh, business plan. So uh, I'm just curious as to, I send it to the Montpelier address and, and uh, there's a list of questions. And, and I mean, is it something you folks, I, I just don't understand what the protocol is. Okay, thank, thanks, Paul. Um, so yes, any questions you're more than w willing to write in a, you know, a, a traditional you know, letter to the Cannabis Board. We have a, a public comment portal through our website where you could submit them that way. And then also, um, you know, our uh, kind of director of outreach, Nellie Marvel, is uh, also kind of can field some questions as well. And that's Nelly, N E L L I E dot Marvel at Vermont dot gov. Um, next on my list is um, Ben Mervis. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for having this session. Um, I think. I had a couple of comments I wanted to make. The first, uh, as always, is that just a thank you for your work on this. In case people who are on this call aren't paying attention, the website was recently updated for the CCB with a font of new information and better uh, records keeping. So really, you all are one of the best jobs I've seen in a state in terms of transparency and clear communication with everybody. Um, I was unable to make yesterday's social equity meeting, subcommittee meeting, so I just wanted to add on to the topic of the diversity, equity, and inclusion group um, that I was hoping to see, and I know you had planned on discussing uh, the queer community, LGBT inclusion in there, but also want to be sure that one thing we've been hearing out in the real world um, is a question about where people who are not black or indigenous fall in, whether or not they count as people of color in the BIPOC inclusion on the social equity side, or whether or not there would be um, clear language regarding people of Latinx uh, background or, or any other uh, ethnicity, any other non-white 
and ethnicity, Asian uh, and Pacific Islanders, and folks who are just wondering whether or not they'll fall on social equity or diversity, equity, inclusion. I often have been saying the discussion around social equity is disproportionate impact, um, but if that is the case, definitely making sure that those folks are by group represented in the diversity, equity, and inclusion category. I also thought I'd share a little anecdote with you because I made it to Portland, Maine on Sunday. Um, and I went with a friend who's been going up there every couple of months just to see what's going on with the dispensaries. And I thought it was very interesting that that friend of mine, their impression was that a lot of the medical offerings in the stores had disappeared. Um, in part because the state allows medical patients to shop at any dispensary and just have the tax waived, I believe is how they do it, and that's how we're discussing doing it. Just wanted to note that you know there was a decrease in medical products, which mostly was a focus on dosing and um, price breaks. A lot of that has to do with you know why why make the specialty products just for medical, but as it pertains to us and our market here in Vermont. Um, I know there's a lot of discussions about caretakers and, and growers. In that world, I think we might lose them in the adult use market, but with edibles, with um, specifically with edibles, we really need to address that 50 milligram per package cap because what I heard from the folks in the stores in Maine is that even just their regular customers that they've had on the medical side who are still in medical and want to support the stores, they're having a really hard time buying these multiple packages of things. So um, addressing that 50 milligram cap, I know that's on a lot of people's mind, just want to bring it up. I will also add, as you know, I am our, our most outspoken person so far about social consumption. There's nowhere to consume legally in Maine if you're visiting, and it made me think about our 13 million tourists to Vermont and the fact that they will also not have a legal place to smoke. Um, or consume the cannabis that we're hoping that they buy, unless they have, of course, a cannabis-friendly arrangement. Um, and so it could result in a lot of public nuisance that we're not looking for, aka my friends who wanted to smoke outside of the dispensary, and I said, please don't, please don't, but they don't listen. So um, just thought I'd share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So um, just uh, once again, for the people that have joined, this is our Cannabis uh, Control Board meeting dedicated exclusively to public comment. So um, I've got a list of people with their hand raised and um, I'm just gonna go through them one at a time. Uh, if you would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand and um, we'll move um, in just a little bit to folks that are on the phone. But um, next on my list is Jesse Lynn. Get in there. All right, there we go. Hi, how's everyone doing? Thanks for having this. I appreciate you guys doing these um, public comments. So a couple things I wanted to mention, of course, usually has to do with the medical program, but as I try to reiterate often that there are a lot more patients using cannabis that aren't necessarily in the medical program per se. So when we look at consumers and consumption overall, we have to remember that a lot of those adult use retail consumers are going to be patients. Um, the, the question or I guess comment I have is just being a little bit surprised at the advisory committees and, or the subcommittees, I'm sorry, not the advisory committees, specific to the medicinal subcommittee. Um, you know, I would love to just either see that committee continue with more people involved or understand a little bit more as to why that committee didn't have as many meetings as other folks. Um, I would like to mention that my understanding is that we had a medical professional who was no longer on the committee, who was you know, hired and outside of Vermont to bring in that perspective, which was great, but they're no longer a part of that committee, Dr. Mary Clifton. And the people in the committee right now are all representatives from the medical dispensary, specifically one dispensary. And in my mind, I do see that as a conflict actually unfortunately several, see several of the appointments to the advisory um, and subcommittees as conflicting roles in some way. Just, just really wanted to bring that up in a public way and, and address that. Um, you know, I, I also will reiterate a few things that Fran started this with by mentioning expanding the caregiver program. I would love to continue and have more of those conversations. I know you guys have and are um, entertaining that and some of that will be during legislative session, but just to mention how important that is 
you know, during this public meeting, I constantly hear from people who are traveling to me rather than using the Vermont Medical Dispensary, and I think we want to avoid that for sure. Um, the couple things that I've heard in the subcommittee from medical specifically that worries me a little bit is they, I have heard that from each representative that they don't actually hear from patients themselves. So a lot of the information and feedback the subcommittee is giving as advice is not coming from patients, that's coming from patient representatives. And I think that's important for the public to be aware of and just understand. What I'm asking for is exactly what you guys are doing tonight. I love this. This is what should be happening through the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee as well, an open forum so patients understand there is a way to voice their opinion just like tonight. I don't think that up until now the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee or the dispensaries themselves have put much effort into reaching out to patients to hear their voices and to get that collective feedback rather than just using their own feedback. So I think that's really important to know and to work towards to, to make a better program. Um, I also will continue to advocate for education. I think we recognize here everything that's brought up can be quelled through education, education rather than prohibition. So with that, we need medical professionals or at least medical professionals educating the people in the medical dispensary system. We need medical professionals helping with the caregivers. Um, and hold on, let me see what else I wrote down in my notes. I think that's about it. But then a couple other things I want to mention is I hope to work with the Cannabis Control Board or the advisory committees or legislative session advocates and see what we can do to continue advancing this program. There, are, there is a state out west in California that now allows cannabis in the hospitals and in retirement homes for end of life care. I'd like to see Vermont be the East Coast leader in that. I think we have that unique ability and I think we need to make some bigger changes to look towards the future of cannabis medicine where this is headed instead of trying to keep it so prohibitive as Vermont has tends to have one of the most medically prohib prohibitive and kind of tight programs across the country. So I um, just wanted to throw that out there as far as along this process. I think the Cannabis Control Board, especially you, you know, you three and the advisory committees have tried to be open, but I do feel there is a difference between the medicinal committee, the amount of meetings they've had, the information and the feedback that's coming back, and understanding why that committee lost a committee member and also who is the medical expert or advocate on that on that advisory committee. And you know, if we have a somebody on that committee with a medical degree that is giving us support and advice that the committee doesn't agree with, you know, how do we work that from a larger level rather than removing that person from the committee is something I would just like to put out there and see as we move forward. So again, thanks for your work and thanks for uh, letting me share. Thank you, Jesse Lynn. <clears throat> uh, next on my list is a phone number, um, 802-399-4471. Um, I see your hand is raised. If you are joining by phone, I think you can unmute by hitting star six. Who's Barry from? Hi, I'm Barry from Heinsberg. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Barry. First of all, uh, you know, I want to thank you for all your hard work. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to join you live. Um, been trying to catch up on all of the uh, videos and stuff you guys posted, and I really, really, really appreciate everything. Um, I just want to talk a minute about slang. You know, the law clearly states that the medical dispensaries are only supposed to have one vertically integrated license each. You know, it's well known that uh, you know this multinational, multi-state organization with hundreds of millions of dollars in assets has Central Vermont Dispensary and some of the Vermont levels, as well as the uh, Crest or Cirrus or whatever they're calling themselves these days, um, men, two retail locations, and those two retail locations have two satellite locations. So that's six satellite locations, or six retail locations, two dispensaries included in those six retail locations, and, you know, their facility in Milton is going from 20,000 square feet to 70,000 square feet. And it's also well known that they're running around the state trying to acquire more places to produce. 
Just wanted to make it clear. They're violating the law. They're running roughshod over us. And it shouldn't be like this. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for your work. I appreciate it. Thanks, Barry. Um, next on my list, Sam Bromberg. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for having another one of these meetings. And uh, first, to echo some of the words that have already been said tonight, thank you guys very much for the, the work you all, for the work you're doing. And clearly, transparently, promptly, punctually producing everything that you have. It's really great to see and to see that there are really considerations being made for farmers and small aspiring businesses who aren't the aforementioned multi-state operators. Um, it's, it's really great to see, so thank you very much for all that work. Um, I really wanted to take a second tonight to, I'm sure I'll raise my hand again, but the first time around to talk about terroir in cannabis or what it's being called in Oregon or Northern California, Appalachians of origin. In the wine industry, terroir is defined as having three main principles, the location where the, the grapes are grown, the variety of the grape itself, and the farmer or farmers who are responsible for growing the grapes and processing it into wine. I think that Vermont has enough microclimates and a diverse enough set of growing regions that terroir or localized Appalachians of origins would be something that would be very beneficial to those wishing to have a unique way of advertising their products, whether it is something that is grown like flour or processed into something like hash. And really that, that was my only comment is that I think it's something that would be great for all of us. And I think it might have to come through the Cannabis Control Board and that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Thanks, Sam. Uh, next on my list is Ann Gilbert. district of the um, Vermont Department of Health but we serve all of Washington County and just wanted to express um, you know the focus of prevention in all the work that you're doing and how important it is to um, really helping um, prevent youth use and early use and a few of the ways of doing that is really strengthening the buffer zone that would be not only around schools, but also playgrounds and parks and childcare centers, and really taking a look at uh, where recovery centers are and being sensitive to that population as well. Um, there are some areas where there has been growing or processing or retail stores that are right near, and um, that you know that that makes it difficult. Um, also thinking about labels and the warnings that should be on labels um, even if it's a lot of information there's um, the high THC levels can be such a such a problem on so many of these developing brains um, and I think there's people who don't really um, you know understand the impact that it can have on them um, in the short term and in the long term um, and then thinking about advertising uh, we know from the tobacco industry um, how strong the advertising was for so many years, and it took a long time to really roll that back. And I'd just like to see Vermont getting it right from the start um, and um, you know, not having any cartoon images like um, Joe Camel and um, making sure that at, uh, you know, when, when kids are walking down the street, you know, in my area on Main Street in Montpelier, um, the, the middle school is nearby and the high school and the elementary school 
But that downtown is their hub, it's their community, and it is their pathway to school. And um, just making sure that there are signs in every store window or sandwich boards out on the sidewalk. So thank you for taking my call. Thank you, Ann. Yeah. Um, next on my list is uh, Carolyn P. Or Caroline. Hello, how are you doing? Hi. I just, um, first of all, thank you all again for the time you're spending and an opportunity to uh, voice our opinion. Um, I really just wanted to comment about Jessie Lynn Dolan. Um, what she brought up has actually been a concern of mine uh, as a medical patient. I am not able to attend those meetings and not having them uh, remote is, a Oh, quite a detriment. I, there's not a chance. I live in the southern part of the state and with my medical conditions it's not realistic for me to be able to get to those meetings and I would love to have my voice heard. Um, so perhaps we could um, move to some sort of Zoom or like this platform to be able to be heard. Um, and that's really it for now um, and I would like to um, also just agree with Barry as well and really like to try to make this focus on small businesses, Vermonters, people who are here doing the right thing in Vermont and let's reward them by not uh, giving this opportunity to large corporations. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'd like to, I see a few more hands up. I see a few people um, that are raising their hand for the second time. I would like to pause just briefly and let anyone who's joined by phone, um, give them an opportunity to make a public comment. There's about uh, you know five or six of you who have joined by phone. And if you'd like to comment, you can do so by hitting star six to unmute yourself. Okay, <clears throat> well then we'll move back to the people that have joined via the link. Um, next on my list is Dr. C. Antley. Hi, thank you for taking my, uh, for calling on me. Um, so I'm a physician in Vermont and I'm uh, here, uh, and our concerns <clears throat> include, um, we have a very high rate of marijuana use in Vermont. It's the highest in the nation past uh, month use. And the United States has a very high rate in the world. So we're starting from a point of extremely high use, um, among adults and children. And so as we launch, and begin a commercial system, um, if that becomes a higher rate, especially with the high concentrates, um, the fallout that we're seeing um, in the mental health system and also in the ERs um, will probably intensify. Um, so psychosis, suicidality, um, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, you know, problems on the, on the highways, um, uh, and addiction, all these things will, will worsen. And um, so therefore, um, a couple of groups of physicians um, that I am a member of have the following concerns. We, we would join Anne Donahue in opposing, you know, advertising, um, since its aim is to increase dependence. Um, and uh, Vermont, you know, has done wonderful things with billboards and there's no reason we can't um, continue that pattern. We were proactive public health wise with our response to COVID. And um, so an innovative um, and pro-health um, uh, stance towards advertising is, is, uh, is recommended. The warning labels should have the following. Um, suicidality, um, 
psychosis, addiction, not habit forming, addiction, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, driving, um, and those that's not too much to put on a, on a label, and we feel like that's important. Um, one thing that's not been talked about a lot, we hear a lot about vertical integration, but vertical integration, you know, historically has um, cultivated addiction. And when this started in England, the, the houses, um, it, it, I mean, the reason that they got rid, that they create, that they outlawed vertical integration is because of the damage that it did and the, and the way that it, it cultivates um it increases addiction. So I think that we would warn um, the committee to not to facilitate any more vertical integration than we already have. Um, shop density is a problem, is an issue. Um, you know, we're, we have very high use rates, as I said, and places like Colorado and California um, have half of their, um, half of their, uh, in municipal municipalities or communities have opted out. And so therefore with low shop, that, that level of low shop density, um, we have, you know, higher use rates than they do even. So it, as you increase shop density, you will increase, you know, the evidence is you will increase use and you will increase use in underserved uh, BIPOC um and needy, uh, perhaps, uh, communities. So, you know, we would warn you uh, to not, to, or to encourage you, I guess, to limit shop density to less than one in 15,000 people. Um, we also, um, th as Anne uh, mentioned, um, we think it's important to limit THC content. What we're seeing, especially in Colorado with the new bill that came out, a lot of evidence of high THC, that means greater than 10% concentration, is really linked to the adverse effects like addiction, uh, like suicidality, like psychosis. So it would be our recommendation to limit THC to 15% or less, 10 would be better. Um, we don't have any drug that's an FDA-approved drug, and THC is an FDA-approved drug that we sell in sweeteners or with flavors. And so we, our recommendation would be to not allow uh, THC in sweeteners or flavors. Um, we think it's important to measure the effectiveness of the advertising regulations and prevention activities that you put in place. Um, and lastly, I think it's important, um, we think it's important to recognize that um, we need to make it explicit that Chapter 13 of Title VII does not displace the Consumer Protection Act with regard to cannabis marketing, so that a victim of deceptive marketing has the right to bring suit under the Consumer Protection Act and clarify that the act does not displace or supersede the Consumer Protection Act with regard to false or deceptive marketing of cam cannabis Basically, what we're saying is people who've been injured by false or deceptive marketing should be able to use the Consumer Protection Act to obtain a redress. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Anley. Um, so I see just on my list a couple of names that have reappeared. I'm just going to go to the one person that hasn't spoken yet before I move back around. Um, so Joe. Um, you're listed as Joe Guest. If you'd like to uh, make a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself. Hello. Hey. Hey, this is Joe. Hey, Joe. Uh, thanks for doing the meeting tonight. And uh, I just had a couple things I wanted to mention that you guys could keep your uh, eyes on. Is, uh, you know, Vermont is based on small farmers. And cannabis needs to be grown. THC is produced by a farmer. So I think the doctors need to stay out of this one, leave the farm to the farmers. And I think that we need to look into the effectiveness of the cure of cancer that THC has provided for a lot of individuals, the Rick Simpson oil. And a lot of us farmers are standing for this to be legal so we can continue to heal people that aren't able to get to it in the medical industry. And 
the vertical integration is the only way some of these small farmers are ever going to be able to survive and succeed with all sorts of sharks out there in the corporate world, as we know. So I just like Vermont to maintain the local craft mentality that we always have had as a state and keep that in the foresight of this whole operation. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So um, just uh, just uh, giving the folks on the phone one more opportunity to chime in. If you'd like, if you join via the phone um, and you'd like to make a public comment, um, please feel free to hit star six to unmute yourself. Um, okay. Uh, well, let's go back around. Fran, do you have another public comment? Yes, Chairman Pepper. Um, I'm just going to uh, stand up again and speak because uh, I want to back up that gentleman who was talking about the activities of the integrateds that were less than uh, proper. And uh, I would back him up because I heard the trepidation in his voice. And I am witness to some of these instances and everything I speak about, I can back up. Uh, first of all, one of the integrateds took moldy dried cannabis that they couldn't sell at one location, brought it back to the headquarters and put it through a supercritical CO2 machine. Now, anybody that knows that the supercritical CO2 machine is not gonna clean that up, it's going to concentrate any issues that that mold may bring. Then, of course, these uh, oils that were made from this were given to people with possible compromised immune systems, such as cancer patients and others. And then there was another incident which was reported by an employee. By the way, that first incident was reported by an employee. Uh, it was literally uh, admitted to by another employee during Hempfest in 2018. The first incident uh, report was on 420, uh, 2018 in Brattleboro. And the second incident uh, would have been at the Hempfest uh, in uh, Burke Mountain, uh, which was then confirmed by the gentleman who, well, while he had to the duty of uh, reprocessing those oils, decided that he couldn't do it, so he quit his job. So those that incident was reported to legislators who then reported it to the DPS. And evidently, they didn't think it uh, uh, an, an issue. Uh, uh, the, 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 other, the second one, I'm sorry. The other one is, is, uh, having to do with, uh, a lot of material going out the back door of one of the, uh, integrateds and it was reported by an employee. Uh, that's the one that went to the DPS. I'm sorry. And, uh, that was, uh, uh, shoved under the rug as well. So those things did occur. Uh, we have a history of that. There was not a lot of supervision in the situation. And I believe I called that out in the medical meeting. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I just wanted to stand up for that gentleman. Thanks, Fran. Um, Sam, Sam Bromberg, do you want to make a comment? Hi, thank you again. Uh, this time I would like to talk about THC caps as a percentage for concentrates and also the proposed of a 50 milligram packaging limit for edibles. 60% uh, is a number that is going to be difficult for a high-end concentrate maker to stay under. So talking about a solventless method of making hash or mechanically separating the resin containing trichome heads from the cannabis flower and trim and using an ice wash hash method of processing and then heat pressing it into rosin, which is common practice for what is available in retail stores in every other legal or medical market state it will be almost impossible for it to be under 60%, which means these products will not be allowed in the retail market, which means that consumers who want them will be forced to purchase them in an illicit market, which will continue to support the existence of an illicit market. These are products that 
are currently on market in Massachusetts. They are not limited by that THC cap and the customers here are going to get them some way or another. Uh, the next concern about the milligram limits per packaging is for products that um, like tinctures. An alcohol extract of cannabis in a half ounce bottle will contain anywhere from 150 to 350 to 500 milligrams in a half ounce bottle where a single dose would be a single drop for anywhere from one milligram to five milligrams, again, depending on the concentration. But if somebody, uh, to step back, a tincture is one of the oldest forms of plant medicine. It is a straight alcohol whole plant extraction. So for somebody who wants to make a product like this, a 50 milligram limit would not allow them to bottle it appropriately and to dilute it down would be wasteful of either Everclear, corn alcohol, whatever it is that's being used as the alcohol. So please consider that there are some sort of non-traditional products that are more medical products that will be entering the market that the current rules really don't help. It's not like a candy. It's not like something that has uh, small serving packaging. The final thing that I will mention during this comment, since it'll be my last, is to really thank you again. It's it's really great to have this opportunity in this forum, and um, I would urge you to please consider what everybody is saying about the importance of access to medical marijuana in the state of Vermont. There are a lot of patients out there who don't have good access to what would really help them have a more high quality and comfortable day-to-day -day life. And it is unfortunate because the medicine is out there. So thank you very much. And I hope that you have a great one. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> so I see um, phone number 802-399-4471 has unmuted. Do you have a comment you'd like to make? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. I just want to uh, reiterate the gentleman who um, spoke up for the farmers, and you know we need to be able to sell to the public. You know, if you guys look, there's a political article um, back a couple of days ago about California and how pounds are going for three hundred dollars. You know, there's there's two things that are going to happen for those guys out there: bankruptcy, or they're going to declare their crops losses you know, and ship them east into the black market to try to recoup. We need to be able to reach the end consumer somehow. If we are, you know, to succeed, we cannot rely on brokers. Um, and that's all. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Jesse Lynn. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me again. Um, so I just wanted to kind of from medical professional to medical professional, just mention a few things quick. So hopefully other docs and medical professionals hear some of this. Um, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm a nurse. I specialize in opioid use and multi-substance use disorder with comorbid mental health disorders in the maternal child health population and was working at UVM in research for quite a while. I'm also the president of the American Nurses Association here in Vermont. And we've... Um, We've created an education program or worked with an organization to have access to an education program for Vermont medical professionals because we recognize and hopefully a lot of other medical professionals speaking today or listening to this recognize that the medical medical programs don't have cannabis education. So doctors and nurses and other medical professionals don't have any of this information on cannabis. What we do have is years and years and years of prohibition and stigma. And a great example, we, we got a research study published seven, eight years ago through UVM on cannabis and human milk feeding. We've repeated the same study two years ago. They will, no one will publish our study because it is too pro-cannabis according to them. So what we know is the research and the information doctors have and are using is the 
research that has been purposely funded to show the negative uses of cannabis. What we also know is that we are seeing some research that is promising and showing us reduction, uh, a reduce, you know, a reduction in the use of opioids, a reduction in the use of fatal overdoses in states that have cannabis. So my, I guess what I'm saying is basically I'm encouraging all medical professionals to recognize that they don't have all the information that they might need and that at a state level or somehow we need to be encouraging one another to get the education so that we have the appropriate information. Because again, education is better than prohibition. We are going to have adult use and a lot more consumers and consumption of cannabis happening. Absolutely. We're going to have more um, yard missions from eating too many edibles. We are going to have more people who struggle possibly with substance use disorder based on cannabis being more accessible. So we do know, not in an extreme rate, but absolutely these things are going to happen. And if we don't have a system and we don't have medical professionals recognizing that that wasn't part of their education and seeking that education out, then we're doing a disservice to not only medical patients, but consumers, because I will continue to reiterate and I'll tell any medical professional till I'm blue in the face. I've heard from way too many veterans who will not get a medical card because they worry about their VA benefits. I've heard from way too many single parents, from nurses and other doctors and people who are concerned to put their name in the medical dispensary system. And with that, those people will be accessing the adult use. So that feeds right into the concentrates. We want a veteran to be able to access high concentrates and high dose medicine, but we don't have want to absolutely insist that they have to be a medical patient in the medical dispensary system and support a corporate conglomerate from out of country instead of a local farmer. We want our veterans to be able to support a local farmer and have access to the concentrates that they want. So the gentleman that spoke to that from the medical perspective, I would absolutely reiterate that. And so many medical per professionals listening to this are probably doing what I initially did a couple years ago and said, no way our concentrates medicinal. That's not okay. We got to keep that out of people's hands. It took me educating myself, breaking my own stigma, listening to anecdotal information and having other doctors reach out to me and say, huh, let's talk about this to really understand why we want and need this. So wrapping it, wrapping it all right back into education instead of prohibition and really pushing that would be something that, you know, I hope to see happen amongst all medical professionals, amongst the Cannabis Control Board. The advisory committees need to take a cannabis education course because we put people on the committees who might not have the education they also need. So I would really hope to see this part of the Vermont program moving forward, please. And I love... Um, you know, I would love to offer any medical professionals or, you know, Chair Pepper, if you can arrange something, a meeting like this, an open meeting specifically for Vermont medical professionals. Let's have questions. Let's have conversations. Let's bring in doctors that have the actual training from cannabis, not just doctors who were in med school 20, 30 years ago and rightfully so have only read and heard the negative fear mongering information around cannabis because that's what they were fed. So we were fed that opioids were great for a long time. We're finally now waking up and realizing they're not and we're seeing cannabis help with an opioid reduction. So same thing, we need people to be open minded and maybe having some of these open meetings like you're doing specifically for medical professionals in Vermont will help to address some of that because we are going to see more issues come up and we need to get ahead of it. And with all that, we just need education to make it for everyone. So thank you. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Uh, Keith Walsh, you'd like to unmute yourself? First, uh, let me say thank you all for some time here tonight. Uh, it's been uh, it's been quite educational to watch the process that you all have gone through from afar. Uh, I do want to say that uh, I believe the cannabis legalization for Vermont is very much a good thing that open access is very much a good thing for our population that some of the struggles that we're seeing in these more mature states is because of the limited access uh, to adult use cannabis uh, california in particular uh, as you all may be aware is selling close to twice as much in the non-ledger market as they are in the ledger market 
part of that has to do with the fact that more than 50% of the municipalities do not allow access to retail sales. Uh, so there is a, there is already a significant market in the state of Vermont, as has already been pointed out. Uh, and I think that we will do best by the entrepreneurs, uh, by this fledgling industry, by the plant itself, and certainly by the consumers. Uh, if we continue to provide access, not just at the retail point, but also, as other members of this group have pointed out, uh, to the full array of cannabis products uh, that are available. Because uh, otherwise, we will absolutely see uh, the non-ledger market continue to proliferate throughout the state, uh, which unfortunately provides access to medicine that may not be clean. Uh, so uh, thank you again for the time. Thank you for uh, taking in everyone's perspective and uh, wish you all the best of luck going forward. Thanks, Keith. Uh, next on my list, Paul Shannon. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, to back up on the medical thing, I'm an honorably discharged 100% disabled veteran. I was wounded overseas in 75. Uh, because I get all my care, at the VA, I have no idea how to access any medical professional that would be willing to write me a recommendation for the list. There never has been, to my knowledge, and I did check with the, at the state house and complained about it, that, that um, this, the DPS doesn't publish the list. If you're not from Vermont and you don't know a primary care provider, A, who understands that cannabis is medicine, and B, is willing to deal with somebody like me. Part of the problem is, as a 100% disabled vet, I go to a doctor and they think I'm trying to double doctor and get medicine. I mean, opioids and stuff. Uh, there's, I've never found a way to get into the medical market, which is why both my daughter and I made the decision to jump into this with both feet. I mean, go for the full, the full banana. I, the, the stuff is medicine for me. Uh, when I got off the opioids that were free, they were, they were prescribed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. They had me consuming 120 milligrams of morphine SO4 and 60 milligrams of oxycodone per day for damn near a decade. And I mean, I'm 6'1", I weigh 200 pounds. Even at that size, I couldn't function on, on that level of medication. Cannabis has saved my life. And I mean, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, and I, I, I wish more people would understand that, that the the medical end of cannabis in Vermont seems to me to be a very closed place. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to accept outsiders uh, like myself, even though I've lived in the kingdom for 30 years, I have no idea. I, I mean, before a doctor will even talk to you, if you call up and make an appointment, you have to pay uh, uh, an office visit fee just to walk in the door and nine times out of 10, they say, no, we don't even deal with that. So it's a losing proposition. And it's a very difficult thing as a vet to deal with. Um, again, that's why my daughter and I are getting into this big time. And we would uh, very deliberately um, not only provide this stuff to veterans who are having difficulty getting on the medical thing, but I mean, uh, we'd give them uh, uh, some percentage of discount, 10% off. Maybe we'd kick in 10 bucks towards the taxes just to make it affordable for them. Uh, it's, it's a terrible thing that when you're facing, hey, you're getting this free medication from the VA, but you don't like its effects and it's doing bad things to you. And you don't really have a medical alternative. So you turn to the market. It's, it's just, it's a difficult thing. And, and I thank you for taking my comment and you all are doing a wonderful job. And thank you for listening to me because that's been a pet peeve for, for well, almost nine years now. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Dr. Antley, is that a, a new hand um, or is that from before? Yeah, it's a new hand. I, I just thought, um, gosh, I'm hearing a lot of uh, a lot of voices talking about uh, high THC in medicine. We we have no evidence based medicine. Uh, we have no evidence that THC greater than ten or fifteen percent is good for any medical condition. We practice evidence based medicine. And following the evidence, this is a this is not a helpful concentration. It's harmful. It's harmful because it increases the risk of psychosis in people who have no history 
of mental illness. It increases the risk of schizophrenia in people who have no history of schizophrenia. And this is not conjecture. Study after study after study has shown this. I know you're all aware of this. I know you've heard from the medical, um, Dr. Levine. I know, I know that, that this has been talked about in your committees. This is a serious risk, as is suicidality. And the use that, the idea that, um, the, the, the idea that this high THC is helpful is very troubling and, and very problematic for, you know, cannabis has been around, let's say, for thousands of years. It's only since we've had it commercialized that we've had these super powerful doses of THC. And the concentrations, as you know, have skyrocketed in the last, you know, couple of years, decade or so. And not only does it increase suicidality, psychosis, schizophrenia, it also increases addiction. And the, the, what, we're, the, what we're learning from Colorado and California is that the shops are not safer. In other words, there was a study in, in Denver. They did a randomized you know, sampling of the, of the shops in, in, and the cannabis. 80% of the cannabis had mold. Um, in in Oregon, the Secretary of State did an audit, and only three percent of the of the of the product that was on the shelves had been had been tested. So um, so this high THC is is got significant uh, risk not only to children but also to adults. There's a recent study that was done not too long ago where they took normal people in the laboratory, cohort controlled, controlled for you know um, mental illness and other risk factors, and gave them THC, and they developed psychotic um, psychotic symptoms in the laboratory. So this is this is a risk, and um, it's it, it's important that we follow the science. It's important that we uh, not. Um, follow, you know, anecdotal reports. I mean, the other thing that we're seeing is that it's quite addictive. Um, there's a new study by Nora Volkoff that came out in March. It's very well done, and it points to it being this concentrated or whatever THC the kids are using is actually more addictive for them or as addictive as opiates in that nine, um, 13 to, to 19 age group. Um, and then you know, Alan Budney reported to us uh, a couple of weeks ago that in his studies looking at treating a cannabis addiction um, a year later, only 10% of the youth were able to be abstinent. So not only is it really addictive, not only does it have carry significant risk factors, but it's also really difficult to break the addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ailey. Uh, next, um, International House of Green. Oh, hello, thank you. And once more, Yuri, like everybody has been saying, thank you for your work. A um, couple of things to, uh, to back up, Fran, Jess, and Paul, and so many that have talked about the medical program. I believe there is a huge need for the cake takers, um, not only for uh, to educate the public on use, but to educate the public on product. Um, like the doctor said, yes, there carries a huge risk uh, having those high potency uh, uh, tinctures, but the, or extracts. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the, there's a double sword with that. Um, when you start putting caps on tenures and, and extracts, that means that the, the lower the concentrate uh, on, of THC, the higher concentrate of other contaminants or other additives put into or let, allowed to be into the concentrate. The higher the con purity of the concentrate, the lower the amount of those things uh, in the concentrate. Uh, wax is, is one of them. Um, so this, again, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, one of the things with the higher concentrates, though, is that you, again, uh, it, you lower the risk of, put it, of allowing um, producers to say, okay, I, ha I have a product that they, they went over. 
that went over the percentage. I have a product that went uh, 65 percent. Oh, gosh, I have to lower it to 60. I have to add something to it to be able to uh, to meet that cap. Um, instead of just being able to say, OK, I'm going to label it as a 65 percent and with the warning, 65 percent, 65 percent concentration of THC. Uh, again, with the, it, it, iterating what it would just just says education. Um, caregiver caregivers are uh, the up the 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 first step in education. I would say for patients, okay, because there isn't a doctor or there isn't a nurse out there who is easily accessible to be able to educate the public. Uh, you're talking about bud tenders now in 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 a, a dispensary. Bud tenders are not really educated to to let people know what a concentrate will actually do to their body. Uh, think of the first time you ever had a, 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 a an alcohol be alcoholic beverage versus now that you're used to that alcoholic beverage. Whoa, we got kicked out. Uh, we can still hear you. Oh, I can, I can see. You can see. Oh, perfect. Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, anyways, uh, anyways, the first time you had alcoholic beverage versus the last time you had it, it's going to be a, a different impact. Uh, a person who has smoked, who smokes for the first time, or takes in a concentrate for the first time, is going to have a different experience than a person who has been taking it for years, who needs an up on dose because the THC level no longer uh, has an effect on their illness. Uh, that's the thing with it, with, with, with uh, uh, caps and uh, caretakers. I do agree that caretakers should also be able to take in more than one, one or, or a few uh, uh, clients. Uh, the reason being it's because if uh, a client, a caretaker falls off the grid, per se, his plants die, uh, power dies, any, for whatever reason, this patient should be able to go to a different caretaker and be able to pick up from where he left off. Um, but also caretakers should be able to take in more than the cap because if, say, I'm a caretaker and I know Joe, he's a caretaker, and all of a sudden all his, all his clients are unable to get product from him because he no, can't produce it, I should be able to say, well, Joe, I know your clients, send them over, at least send one or two over to me. I should be able to take care of them. Uh, again, uh, options on not only how many caretakers I can, uh, I can have, but also how many, how many um, patients I can have. Uh, the last thing I have is on lab license fees. That's the only thing I did not see a secondary uh, column for. Everything has a a, a a a a column and a B column, except the lab fees. They they remain at fifteen hundred, no matter across the board. Uh, that's all the comments I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Brian Armstrong. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for everybody's time and letting me speak. My name is Brian Armstrong, uh, born and raised in Vermont. I also have my hand in a couple different small businesses, um, and I've been a cannabis user since I was 15. I uh, use very little, if any, alcohol or no other substances. It has been a calming force and a productive force in my life, but that's not actually what I was going to mention. Um, unfortunately, I lost my first wife to cancer a little over five years ago. And for six months, I was her caretaker. I gave her shots. I gave her opioids, fentanyl patches. And for the longest time, she simply would not try edibles because she didn't want to get stoned. But I was just, you know, here's a guy who's loving on his wife and losing her to cancer. And when I finally got her to try a strong edible, she had the best night's sleep that she had in months. So I am a firm, firm believer that the Cannabis Control Board and their wisdom should allow for high concentrate products, because just like high concentrate alcohols, I think with the right people, adults, and obviously this is an adult product, it can be used responsibly, intelligently, and for very, very productive you know, uh, purposes. 
The other thing is, I'll be very candid with you. In the summer, I enjoy joints. But in the winter, <laughs> windows are closed. I just assume put less smoke in my body and less smoke in any other inhabitants of my household. So I'm absolutely a belief that you know high concentrates have their place in a responsible market. The other thing I'd like to you know plug and ask for the commission to consider is I understand there's movements underway that suggest we possibly slow this process down and you know make it better. Um, as a small business owner who's really worked hard to put Vermonters to work and provide for their family, one of the greatest challenges that I think is happening right now to smaller entrepreneurs like myself is we're expected to go out and create jobs, create, you know, uh, buy locations, put millions of dollars into infrastructure. I'm hoping to bootstrap it for a you know, heck of a lot less than that as a, as a Vermonter. And I think if they stall this, you're only going to create opportunity for bigger companies to weather the startup storm. And for example, we're looking to purchase real estate for a cultivation license. We're trying to time it in a hot real estate market to buy it early enough that we're not left out, but also, you know, we have the carrying costs, the debt service. So I'm working hard to put Vermonters to work and I would love the cannabis, you know, control board to move reasonably quick as they proposed, get us to market next year so we can invest in our communities, generate tax paying jobs and support local communities in a healthy and responsible way. And I do believe that also includes high concentrate cannabis products for adult responsible use. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. So it uh, looks like uh, we're almost out of time for tonight. Barry, uh, your hand is up. You got the last uh Last comment of the night. Or maybe not. Uh, 802-399-4471. Okay. Um, just to double check, no one else on the phone has a public comment. Uh, if you do, please hit star six to unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we heard you for a second there. You're muted. He's muted. Okay. I don't see if I can, can you hear me. Yeah, we can hear you now. <laughs> can you hear me now we can hear you now yep all right sorry uh you're muted Jet again sit mute. <laughs> this is so funny i'm so sorry can you hear me now i can hear yes. you now yeah Thank you. I just want to speak to the good doctor for a second. Thank you for your opinion. Thank you for your point of view. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I really appreciate this forum. And I, I think, like Jesse Lynn said, more forums like this are necessary so that opposing point of views can be brought together and then educate each other. Um, I would encourage her to go into the public comments on the CCB website and post those studies. And I would gladly read them if she, uh, if she posts them. Um, I would also encourage her to take a moment, 20 minutes for a time, and learn about, um, using her words, what the kids use today, um, which is, you know, ice water extraction, which, which has been around for thousands of years. Um, so, so hash has been around for thousands of years, as long as cannabis has been around. You know, just take 20 minutes and, and, and Google ice water extraction versus ethanol or butane extraction. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we have open forums like this to educate each other. And uh, I appreciate you guys bringing us together tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, and thanks to everyone who joined today. Um, you know, we really do uh, take every one of these comments very seriously, and um, you know, we're moving at a very quick pace right now. And so now is really the best time to get in touch, to speak uh, through our open uh, public comment portal on our website. Um, we are having. 
we're going to start having two meetings a week, um, you know, on Wednesdays and Fridays where we're going to make a lot of decisions. Those will be streamed um, and you can join remotely. Um, there'll be public comment periods throughout both of those. So, um, you know, feel free to join there and um, appreciate everyone joining us today. Julie, Kyle, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I'm good. Thank you everyone for your comments. It's always interesting to hear. Thank you. Ditto. Thank you everybody for joining. As Julie said, it's great to hear a lot of different um, opinions and thoughts and, and bringing some of those together and hopefully folks can join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to uh, call this uh, or adjourn this meeting for the night and uh, see you both tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.